Let us pray. O Lord, our God, speak to us. Your servants wait to hear a word from you. Bless us, O God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us take our seats. Is it true familiarity breeds contempt? If we would apply this to relationship, they say that some people can become bored with the person they're in relationship with. This can lead to us stop treating a loved one with respect or stop paying attention to them. This can also apply not only to our loved ones, but also our hobbies. Have you ever been a person who enjoyed a particular sport? Maybe you're on a swim team or a tennis team or a football team and you are passionate about it. You would practice all the time, but somehow throughout the years, that love for that sport just died up or fizzled away. Allow me to give you another few examples. We start a new job. We've been waiting to get a job. We love our work. We've been dreaming about how we can improve ourselves and contribute to the workspace. But slowly by slowly over the years, as it passed on, we lose our enthusiasm. Your pro productivity begins to decrease. You're no longer excited about going to work. You begin to cut corners. You do just the least amount possible. No longer enthusiastic. Imagine, just imagine if you were a medical doctor and you went into that doctor to tell him or her about your problems. And as you're speaking, the doctor is playing with his or her phone. Wait a minute, wait a minute, I got a call. Now you're telling the doctor how sick you are and perhaps you've been, you think you're gonna die and the doctor's taking it, ah, <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, no, 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 we'll meet for dinner tonight. Okay, 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 okay. What were you saying? Imagine, imagine being an engineer and working on a building site and, and, and you just cut corners because you just can't be bothered. You have to meet the boys tonight and, and you can't be bothered with this. You can apply this to any profession. Cutting, cutting corners in the workplace is characteristics by skipping and avoiding steps that are, in, that are important. Cutting corners is not a good thing, my friends. Research says that it's, this can lead to negative outcomes. It lowers job, job performance, even safety. I'm not sure how many people here are married. And I won't even ask you to raise your hand. But young people who are not married, just indulge me for a few minutes as I speak to the married people that are here. This can happen, happen in our marriage or any relationship that we're in. We find ourselves not doing the things we used to do when we dated. My daughter's here and I pray that she doesn't tell my husband. I hope this is not gonna be on YouTube, but I remember when I was dating my husband and I come from a generation that dates. When I was dating my husband, how he would come over and visit me and he says, don't worry, I'll make tea for you. And then I said to him, but I don't know how to make ugali, I'll show you. And he would take the spoon and help me to stir the ugali. Now, he doesn't even go near the kitchen. It's almost as if the kitchen, it has a disease in it. I don't even remember the last time he's ever made tea. And if my daughter tells daddy what I said, you're in trouble. <laughs> remember the time when, when you used to receive Susan a love letter that was so nice and worded so beautiful from your loved one who told you how much you make their day and how much you're like the stars in the sky. And there's no one like you because when you walk into the moon, the, I mean the, the room, the moon shines as if you're a shining sun. 
remember the time when you received those type of love letters? Do you remember the time, ladies or gentlemen, when you were surprised by the flowers and it was just because? Nothing special. It wasn't Valentine's Day. It wasn't your anniversary. It wasn't your birthday. It was just because. Now, the laughter has stopped. They come home very late and they proclaim when they walk through the door, I'm so tired, meaning don't start your kalele. I don't want to hear it. I'm too tired. I went to a restaurant one time and there was a very well-known Kenyan sitting there with his wife and they sat through the lunch, not saying a word to each other. From all the hours that we sat there, and this was when it, during the time my daughter was young, so we'd go on Sunday afternoons and she was playing and my husband was sitting there and we'd have my sister-in-law there and we watched them not even look at each other. I'm sure this was not the same like it was in the beginning when he was courting this young lady or wanting to marry her. What happened to their love? As a member of a congregation, we just come to church. It even happens in our Christian walk. We just walk into the church any kind of way. We don't care. We do this Sunday after Sunday. We've been Christians for so long. Nothing changes. We get up and do whatever it is that we have to do, whether it's lead the service, whether it is singing, and we just do it any kind of way. We read any kind of way. Thank you, Robert James, for the amazing reading that you did. I won't talk about somebody else. If we identify with this, our relationship becomes so ordinary. We become, we, we lose, we have, we, we become indifferent and apathetic and routine and even mechanical in what we do. Whether it's coming to church or whether it's just being in a relationship with the other. Did you notice the reading of the Psalms today? With something in his mouth sticking out? He lacked luster. He didn't read it over, unlike Robert James. He was not familiar with the words. Did you hear him? Almost as if the word of God was not important to him. The word of God was casual. He was indifferent about it as he read. His mind was not even on the reading. His mind was thinking about the movies that the church is supposed to go to. So therefore he stopped in the middle and said, Watson, how about the movies? Brothers and sisters, every aspect of the word of God, the service that we're in, conveys a meaning. It's important to us. It, it ministers to us. Imagine if he would have read the word because he's been studying this passage and this passage becomes part and parcel of who he is. And if he said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye earth, serve the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is God who made us and not we ourselves. We are the God's people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into the gates with thanksgiving. Enter into the courts with praise. Give thanks unto the Lord and bless God's name. For the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endureth forever his faithfulness throughout all generation. Now I know I'm pointing my finger at someone, but please know that I told him to do it like that, okay? He didn't do it on his own. Think about this for a few minutes. Allow this passage to marinate in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit. If the reading of this Paris passage marinated with us throughout the whole week, dwelt inside of the reader. 
imagine how they would become a living reality. The reading of the word would minister to you. It is not a preamble just before the sermon. It is a word of God to the people of God. My brothers and sisters, the Psalms gives us seven action words. Make, serve, come, know, and be blessed. It gives us five action words. Did I say seven? Did I say seven action words? I'm sorry, I was thinking about the seven churches. It gives us five action words. Serve the Lord with gladness is what we're called to do. Gladness is an attitude of the heart. Psalms 4 and 7 speaks of the gladness of a farmer that celebrates when they have a crop. You know, we're living in a time of drought. And imagine if you planted something and you were the only one with that crop, how glad you would be that your sukuma has come up. How glad you would be that your maize has come up. You would be walking around with your head up high telling everyone. Well, that is how it is when we serve God with gladness. No, knowing that God has blessed you. Gladness is a decision, not just an expression. The next part tells us that know how our disposition should be. Come into his presence with singing. Brothers and sisters, the songs that we sing during worship are not just words that we just sing, but God is ministering to you. Think about it. The last song that Carol led us in, we worship you, O oh God. You're Alpha. You are the first. You are the last. You are the beginning. You are the end. God, we worship you. Imagine coming and singing that, knowing what God has done for you. Knowing through difficult times how God was there with you and God will continue. It is an affirmation of your faith that God will be with you. Friends, God is awakened, awakened in our darkest hours as we sing to God. We choose to, to sing with confidence, knowing that God is listening to us. What does it mean to know that the Lord God is good? The Lord God is good, that we read and we heard from the Psalms. You might have received Christ into your life when you were a child. It might be many years ago. But, and you come to church Sunday after Sunday, but there is something about knowing that God is good. I've experienced it for myself. So you're talking out of experience. So when you hear the Psalms, your mind goes back to the time when you experienced the goodness of God. The God we serve is not ordinary. Nothing like men or women who will fail you. God is good all the time, we say. The God is the first and the last. Whatever we need, all we have to do is take it to the Lord. We are called to be in a perpetual state of thanksgiving. Children of the Most High God, we cannot get distracted, complacent as we enter into God's presence. We cannot just come because, oh, I'm just here. This is what I do on Sunday to fill up my Sunday morning. But we come knowing that we come with an expectation of faith, knowing that God has something here for you. Carol once again has said this when she prayed. Come expecting something. Come knowing that God has something for you. Thanksgiving is internal gratitude of the heart and the mind. Our praise of thanksgiving comes from a disposition of thankfulness. Our thanks must come from a spirit of thankfulness. Never get complacent like the church of Ephesus we read, read about today. They left 
their first love. Their heart was no longer a heart devoted to God. The church, the, the city of Ephesus, was, had the reputation of being the greatest. It was a commercial city. It sat at the mouth of, the river, of a river. The river brought transportation of goods and people all the time. This was an important city. The city had all the gold and the silver and the pearls and the linen. It brought vessels of ivory and precious woods. The city was a wealthy city, my friends. The letter was written to this church. We see that Jesus was, Jesus was commending them at first for the good things that they did. They endured difficult times. Jesus appreciated them. But then Jesus said to them, but look how far, in some translations, you have fallen. How deep you have fallen from the truth. The lack of genuine love, my brothers and sisters, their love had waxed cold. How could you say your love, your brothers and sisters, the Bible says, but yet you allow them to go hungry? They left their first love. They became mechanical churchgoers. Have you ever been in a place, I, in my mind, I, I was laughing at one place place I went in because people were standing up introducing themselves and every time someone stood up to introduce themselves they say the usual praise God and then the people say amen and then they would go on to say the next person praise God this happened about 10 or more times and I said to myself is this mechanical is this people really genuinely feeling the praise of God and is the response really coming out, the amen, or is it kind of like a stimulus response? You know the experiment where there was a stimuli and a response? You say, praise God, I say amen. You say hallelujah, I say thanks be to God. But yet, do we really feel it? Have we lost our first love? It becomes mechanical. It's almost like... My friends, our heart is not there, but we say words, but the words are just words. The loss of love we see at church, in the church I'm talking about you and me, is how we go through life relying on our own. We say to ourselves, I went to the finest university. I went to the University of Nairobi, my friends. So you know I got it going on. I graduated from Alliance. So you know I'm really smart. I don't have to ask God before I do something. I'm intelligent. I got this. I don't have to speak face and face God before a board meeting. I don't have to pray during a board meeting because I'm masterful at running my business of the organization that I started. I don't have to pray before I go into this board meeting. I got this. When you have been married for so long, like I have, we tell people, I don't have to pray about my relationship. Besides, I have a relationship like everyone else, Carol. Everyone else has this type of relationship. We accept the abnormal in our lives. You become a professional married person. I got this, Elder. No need for me to pray over the passage that I'm going to read on Sunday morning. And if you don't mind me using Robert James as an example, Robert, I said, Robert, I want you to extend the passage. So Robert stood as people were singing and he read and he read and he read and he read. And I like that because he didn't want to get up here not familiar. He wanted to become the embodiment of the word unlike some people that I won't mention their names. <laughs> like the church of Ephesus, we stop speaking, seeking the face of God in everything that we do, in all aspects of our life. We take for granted we will do okay. 
No need to invite God into anything. We go to work, we go to church, we go to our office, and we don't stop to say, thank you, God. Ride with me, oh God, in whatever mode of transportation I'm in. We have lost our first love. Relying on self instead of our friends. If I have the problem, the first thing I'll call up and say, Susan, I need your help. This is the problem that I'm having. And wait for Susan to give me the, the answers to my problem. Instead of me turning to the face of God and saying, God, I need you. True believers become slaves to the will of Christ in our life. We seek after God, not our will. This is why the Lord said, told his disciples in John 15 and 5, apart from him, they can do nothing. Not on your intellect, not on who's who, not on because you know who my father is and, and because of who my parents are, I, I, I can do whatever I want to do. They didn't rely on their names and their reputation, but seek after God's will. To abide in the love of Christ is to obey Christ. Deny self. And what does this passage say? Take up your cross and follow me. We are called not to walk according to the flesh, i.e. according to self, but walk according to the spirit of God. This was a message to the church in Revelation. If they walked in the spirit, they would remain in the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, and they would be overcomers. If the church did this, the passage said, they would have everlasting life. God loves us so much that he wanted them to come back to their rightful place in God. Now, you know how we are. Elder, if time and time again, if the church took me to a disciplinary committee for allowing Yagi to come up and do what he did today, and time and time again, if you told me not to do it, but yet I still did it, what would you do? You'd write me off. I think it's time for you to, to leave this church because we no longer want you here. If God did this to the church in Revelation, and just said, look, for these things, you do one, two, three, you do it good. But four, five, and six, I'm sorry. <laughs> Something's wrong with you. If God did this, imagine, but the love of God for us said, but you have an opportunity. I want to correct you. I want to show you what you do wrong so that you can get it right. Brothers and sisters, why is it that people of God are so unforgiving? We say we love each other, but we're so easy to write each other off. It was Jesus on the cross that what did he do? He prayed for those who were crucifying him. Can you imagine every time I go into session, it's Elder Veronica who always talking about something that Reverend Ochilo didn't do? Imagine, I don't like that elder. I don't know why they made her an elder anyway. <sighs> she's in this service? Well, I'm going out at the service. I'm not going to stay here if she's here. We write people off. How many times have I corrected you, Watson? How many times have I told you? I notice what you have in, in your, your jacket pocket. I know what you have in there. And I see you with it. How many times have I told you about that, Watson? Watson, we don't want you in this church anymore. We write people off but the love of God. But that love is not just vertical, me, God, heaven, but it's also horizontal, meaning I love you. And I gotta learn to love you, even my enemies. The church that Jesus wrote the letter to in Revelation was a church that did not love. Love is not a word, oh, I love you, Reverend. I love you so much, but you see that I can't feed my family because I'm your next door neighbor. You see I'm having a difficult time paying school fees and you won't say, I just want to give you a little something just for you. Love is action. 
We're called to love our brothers and sisters. No matter what ethnic group, no matter what color, no matter what country they come from, we're called to love. But yet, I keep all the doctrines of the church. Do you know the handbook, the doctrines of the, the Presbyterian church? I know it backwards and forward. I can tell me, call a page. If you say page 50, I can tell you what is on page 50. I can tell you. But yet, I'm always assassinating the character of everyone that is around me. I'm always the first one on Facebook sending nasty messages about someone who comes from a different part of the country than I do. I'm always, do you see the shoes he's wearing? <laughs> is that what he's got to church with? Is that how he look? He's so shabby. Look at him. Look at her. We're called to love. That's the message of the church. Repent, come back to God. If you're gonna be an overcomer, you have to love. We have to be just like Jesus. Jesus was the embodiment of love, not words. Oh, you, you, yeah, I, give my, I give my money to the poor. Jesus was in action. Imagine if Jesus saw the blind man and said, oh, Paul Isana, you're blind? Oh, I'm so sorry. You see my disciples over here? They take care of all that. I don't handle that, okay? So I, I can't pray for you, I don't have time. Just speak to my disciples, okay? Because I'm busy, I'm very busy. I'm on my way to Jerusalem, I got stuff to do, okay? As a matter of fact, I'm God's son and being God's child, I don't have time to handle your issues. I'm too important. What did, we, what did Jesus do? It's love in action. Jesus stopped and he touched the blind man. He spoke the word and healed. Love in action. Tradition said that the woman shouldn't even be near me, lest no one touch the hem of my garment. But Jesus didn't worry about tradition. And what does tradition, tradition say? But he stopped and said, what do you need to the woman? That's love. It's an action. And that was the problem with the church. When Jesus said, I have something against you. Brothers and sisters, we're here today. And we have not practiced that love. We've lost our first love. We've lost our first love. We've lost our first love because we are guilty of not loving the way God has told us to love. We are guilty of being complaint. <clears throat> you know that praise team? I don't like them. Mm -mm. No. Susan is in one and Carol's in another one. And, uh -uh. Mm -mm. No, no. Mm -mm. One Wabugu leads a choir in one place. Ah, uh, no. Well, praise be, instead of saying praise be to God for the gifted sisters, Praise be to God for the group of brother and sister who can sing and play. We thank God that God has given them the gift that I don't have. But instead, we have to find something to pick, pick, pick. Brothers and sisters, we have lost our first love. I invite everyone to stand today. God, on this day, we come to you. And God, we invite you to give us a freshness in our Christian walk. We invite you, God, to do something different in our lives. We come to church with such lackluster commitment. We get up and lead, we, we sing in the praise team, we even sit in the congregation, oh God, thinking about what it is we're gonna do in the next few minutes. God, help us to recommit ourselves. Help us, oh God, to know that you're in every aspect of thy worship service. When we walk into the service, when we walk into the sanctuary, we walk here with a difference. We walk saying, God, what is it that you wanna to say to me today? How is it that you wanna to minister to me today? God, it's me, I need to hear that song. I, it's me, oh God, I may not be able to sing like Carol or Susan, 
or the Wambugus, but God, I'm lifting my cracky voice and, and lifting up the words to you because it's coming from my heart. Lord God, I need to be transformed. I've fallen from my first love. I've not loved the way I should love. I've depended on self. I've depended on my friends. I've depended on my parents, but not on you. So God, I pray for everyone that is here today. Help us to love, oh God, the way you've called us to love. Help us to love people, dear God, no matter where they're from in the world. Help us to love like Jesus loved, a love that is in action. Here we are, God. When we leave here, we want to be able to say, surely God has met us in this place. God has met us when we gave our offering. God has met us when we sung songs. God has met us when we listened to the word of God. God has met us when we heard the preach word. Speak, O oh God, to your people. Whatever it is, O oh God, help us to come back to our first love. Help us not to be like the church, dear God, but let us be overcomers because we've come back to you. We recognize our faults. And we said, God, it's me. It's me standing in the need of prayer. This is my prayer in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.